Okay, well I started the camera rolling. Okay. It's, uh, what's the, what's today? The 24th? 25th. Okay, it's April 25th, 2019. And this is chapter 15 of Human Action, the review study guide from Robert Murphy. If anyone was to ask me to, like, oh, what chapter should I read from Human Action? I would be like, chapter 15. <laughs> yeah. This has everything in it. It all, mm -hmm. like, broken down. As far as I can tell, there, there might be more, but... Right. I got halfway through it because I didn't realize how long it was. I didn't realize how long it was either. So I got to part 10, uh, Profit and Loss. Mm -hmm. And it seems all pretty much pretty straightforward stuff. Like, um... None of it was too surprising. It was just a spelling out of like obvious stuff. Yeah. But it feels like it maybe needs to be written if it's going to be in a book like this. Mm -hmm. So how many parts are there of this thing? There's fourteen. Fourteen. Yep. Okay. Well, let's see what we can get through. Okay. Study question one: the characteristics of the market economy. What are the main characteristics of the market economy? Uh, I would say capital is a main characteristic. Yeah, that seems correct. There's, I think he also said there has to be changing conditions, like mm -hmm. there isn't really a market. Um, or there are, can't be entrepreneurs taking risks. Uh, if there aren't conditions changing. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe there's just a couple of straightforward answers. Social system where individuals specialize in their occupations and the means of production, natural resources, mm -hmm. tools, are privately owned. Okay, yeah. Everyone acts to serve his own interests in a market economy this is achieved by aiming to satisfy the desires of other people. Mm -hmm. So that seems critical. That seems important. What is it meant by the market is a process? I think the the analogy here is how the market is like a true demar democracy in that every dollar you spend is kind of a vote for, you know, something to happen. Mm -hmm. And let's say, I don't know, you, you buy a lot of coffee, but I buy a lot of tea. Yeah. My, my votes aren't in vain because they're still going towards that tea producer. They're still making tea happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, I think to me, that's really what the market process is, is that kind of voting process through participation in the market. That's an interesting distinction that you make, because in a democratic vote, it would be like coffee wins every time, because more people want coffee. But you still get the tea, well, even if you're voting for it. I mean, maybe in like the United States sense of a democracy. <laughs> yeah, not in England. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think in like the sense of the word, like the market's more of a democracy. Like there's oh, a, yeah. like having weighted votes. I see what you meant. Yeah. yeah. I, I just meant in terms of like there's only one winner. Yeah. And that's not that way. That in the doesn't market. seem like a true democracy. Yeah, maybe not. Comment. Oh, so what is meant by the market is a process? You're you're saying that um it's a process of voting for what you want and, and, yeah, and then, getting more of that. Yeah. That makes sense. And I like, would say also that it's a process of discovery mm -hmm. where the entrepreneur is like, I think people demand this. And then they put some capital and resources and technology into producing mm -hmm. X and then they find out if it's profitable or not. Mm -hmm. There is no mixture of the two systems possible. There is no such thing as a mixed economy, a system that would be in part capitalistic and in part socialistic. 
this was really interesting to me because I disagreed with this, but then he won me over. <laughs> right. And so, like he said, even in a situation where um, the state takes over some type of um, takes over something, they still have to participate in the market. Like you can't. Uh, they still have to participate in the market to compete. Yeah, they have prices, uh, they mm -hmm. have wages to pay their employees, um, their raw materials, rent for their buildings or whatever, they have capital goods. Mm -hmm. And that just can't be, you can't do away with that stuff, I guess. Unless uh, the entire world were engulfed in a system of socialism where Right, they even no said, prices. you know, like uh, Russia, the socialist economy that they still had to, they had imports and exports, so they still had prices. Yeah, yeah, they still had to deal with the market. Part two, capital. What are the definitions of capital? Capital consumption and saving. So, capital is the money value of your assets. Mmm, the money value of your assets, that makes sense. So what you what you could get for your um, the the assets that you have on a market if you yeah. were to liquidate them or sell mm -hmm. them. So that's capital, capital consumption. I guess would be um, when you expend your assets in. Um, producing something but don't gain more of them mm -hmm. you end up uh, consuming your your capital right and so saving is the opposite of that yeah ending up with more mm -hmm. capital so is, so that means like capital is created and destroyed yeah definitely through uh, either productive endeavor or, or um, I don't know what the destructive uh, or the market like you just hold a gold coin and maybe 10 years from now that might be more capital because it has more oh yeah well in that, in that sense perhaps uh, saving was productive no, I don't know. That wasn't really a productive... Int I don't know. How is it... I agree with you mm -hmm. that it, it could be more valuable, but how is that... Because everything's... It, there's no fixed point, right? Mm -hmm. So, like... Oh, so it's through the avoiding of destructive uh, endeavors yeah. <laughs> rather than the mm -hmm. employment of productive endeavors. Okay. Why is it impossible to separate the concept of capital from the context of the monetary calculation? Why is it impossible to separate the concept of capital mm -hmm. from the context of monetary calculation? Oh, well, you answered that in the, your answer to the first uh, question here. Yeah, because you, you need to give it a money value. Yeah. And although it's not a perfect... Like, you can never truly find the exact capital you have in t terms of money value, unless it's cash, I guess, or the denomination you're talking about. Right. What is the notion of real capital? Why is it nonsensical? Real capital? I don't know. I must have missed that. Uh oh, and I don't see anything about it in the summary. So uh, I guess 
this might speak to it. The term capital goods refer to the physical objects that man produce and can be used to augment future production. Although a so socialist community would have capital goods, it would only metaphorically have capital, for the latter requires economic capital calculation to be mean meaningful. So, can you put that in other words? I can't so understand. if, um, so if you were in a socialist economy, there would be no uh, economic calculation. Therefore, there would be no capital. Uh, so, okay, presumably you have this factory and no money. Right, there's no prices. So you produce screws and you trade your screws for, I guess, whatever people give you for you them. You don't trade. It's a socialist economy. So what, people just come and take the screws and you make them and that's it? Um, I mean, the one sole provide like one entity is responsible for the production of goods and distribution just whatever however they say oh so they produce the screws and deliver the screws to everyone in the correct quantity <laughs> yeah <laughs> so okay. and they say yeah there's no prices <laughs> so there's no capital oh my god so how could it go wrong yeah i don't know if that answers the question it's nonsensical. If that yeah. was the follow-up, how is this nonsensical? So, yeah. Okay, I think you've got it spot on. So, three, capitalism. The market economy, this is a comment. The market economy is a man-made mode of acting under the division of labor. But this does not imply that it is something accidental or artificial and could be replaced by another mode. Okay. It's man-made, but it's not accidental. Comment. Entrepreneurs grown old and tired, and the decadent heirs of people who succeeded in the past dislike the agile pervanus who challenged their wealth and eminent Social position. Yeah, seems to be the state of capitalism. So people like Andrew Carnegie, they kick ass for years and years, and then they're like, I'm done. I can't. I, there's, you know, there's young people, and they're not my children, and someone else is going to be the best capitalist now. So, for the sovereignty of the consumers, who really determines what is produced? Consumers, bang. Mm -hmm. They demand what is produced and reward the producers, the and entrepreneurs. What is the role of the entrepreneur? To serve the needs of the consumers. Mm -hmm. Comment, the entrepreneurs, capitalists, and farmers have their hands tied. They are bound to comply in their operations with the orders of the buying public. What is the difference between a political democracy and a free market with regard to the power of votes? And I think we already said it. Yeah. The, uh, the free market is not like winner take all to democracy, I guess. You put that. Yeah. A single vote actually means something mm -hmm. in a free market. Whereas if I can vote to um, produce moxie, even though nobody else wants moxie, <laughs> it could still get made. And I could have what I want. Um, why is it absolutely fallacious to compare big companies with kingdoms, 
what is the main difference between a company and a political sovereign? So the company needs to compete every single day to remain a big company. Don't kingdoms? I don't understand why that well, is a not, big difference. Not necessarily a kingdom. They aren't challenged every day. Yeah, they don't... I guess what, what kind of kingdom we're talking about. But, I mean... The, the people that are under the kingdom don't vote on mm. who's in charge. Like, the big company, every single day, they have to like, like, compete with everyone else. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, and and uh, consumers are free to choose others' mm -hmm. uh, uh, competition. So whereas, like, the Queen of England, no one says, well, I'm the new Queen of England... People can be like, I'm the new Shell Oil, or, uh, you know, I produce oil better than Shell, and you should choose me. So, five, competition. What is the difference between biological competition and social competition? I remember this being an interesting point too. There's something about how in biological competition, uh, one species dominates and survives uh, through like predation, but in social competition, uh, a person can uh, benefit by uh, p peaceful coexistence and serving, you know, being the most beloved. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you just nailed it. Yeah, there are no losers in the comp in the social competition necessarily like there are in biological competition. Mm -hmm. It's just more of a ranking than a death sentence. All right. see here. What is meant by catalactic competition? To which field is it restricted? Why is it a social phenomenon? Catalactic competition. Well, if I recall, that has to do with the market. So, a catalactic competition is like who uh, serves the most people in the market, I'm guessing? Mm. Oh, it's not summarized. Oh no. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I do remember reading this, but... Yeah. So a catalactic competition. To which field is it restricted? And why is it a social phenomenon? So my best guess as to the correct answers to these questions would be a catalactic competition is one in which people are competing on the market mm -hmm. um, to make the highest profit, serve the most people. Uh, to which field is it restricted? I would say entrepreneurship. Um, those are the only real participants. You know, consumers aren't really in the catalactic competition, it's the entrepreneurs. Right. And why is it a social phenomenon? Um, because it's not a biological competition where mm -hmm. there are um, winners and losers, everyone can win to a certain degree, it's just less or more. Okay. I'd say that's a pretty good answer. Yeah. What are the two cognitions of monopoly? So, I think the traditional one we think of is, you know, monopoly over coffee. Maybe you just, or I guess the good example would be diamond production. 
and like one person controls all of that and then the other is like the services of Brandon like I have, <laughs> I have been a monopoly to I don't know do something for anyone like but like my individual like kind of monopoly okay that makes so, sense I guess, oh. like yeah there's like a local monopoly and then like monopoly over like an entire thing the example given in the book was a hotel has a monopoly on the services provided within its yeah. domain. Mm -hmm. Like, you want room service? We're the only ones who do room service. Ain't nobody else from room 203 gonna go and serve you in room right. 2015, or 2015. And like the Wentworth and the Sea has a monopoly on rooms in the Wentworth uh, and the Sea. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, right. So what is the significance for each, uh, of each for the market? Wait a minute, we didn't get into the, the monopoly on, uh, oh no, you did, you said coffee. Yeah. So like if right. you're the only coffee producer. Yeah. One weird statement in this chapter was that, um, the only way that there could be like a real monopoly, if I, if I understood that correctly, was if there was like a global super state and they had a total monopoly on the production of food and they could punish their political opponents by starving them all to death. You remember that? No. It was, uh, maybe, maybe I misplaced the memory, but it seemed like they were saying real monopolies like the, the type the most people talk about don't really exist. Mm -hmm. Like the coffee monopoly that, or the diamond monopoly, other people can still enter that market. There's no. But can they? Real restriction. Sure. Why not? I mean, because discover diamonds. I mean, they like one entity has the entire world supply of diamonds. I thought you know you could find diamonds on your own. Yeah, but they own like where like this. The source of like the scarcity where like diamonds are mostly found. And can't you like produce diamonds too? True. In a lab? Yeah. I don't know, I I guess maybe I don't fully understand this chapter, the mm -hmm. two connotations of monopoly and I have to review that. What is the significance of each in the market? So, even if you have a monopoly, you still need to compete in the market. You know, oh, yeah. Good say point. Say if there is a diamond uh, monopoly, you still, maybe you're selling jewelry, you still need to compete with, you know, gold or other forms of jewelry. That makes sense. And even the, the Wentworth needs to price its um, rooms at a rate that's reasonable enough to um, attract customers and cover their costs so they can operate at a profit. Mm -hmm. So and I think that kind of answers the next question. Um, why can we safely neglect the existence of monopolies if there are no monopoly prices that emerge? So if a monopoly prices did emerge, then there truly would be no other alternative. You have a monopoly so you can jack up the price. Yeah, but then no one would be able to be their customer and it would be useless to be a monopoly. Right. So I think the, uh, the point the point that I'm getting from this is that yes, there can be natural monopolies that emerge, like maybe that, that diamond monopoly or whatever, mm -hmm. but if they raise the rates to a million dollars a ring, they're not gonna have any customers anyway, so it just doesn't even make any point to be the mon to to act as a monopolist or, or jack up the rates so high. What are monopoly prices in Nisi's view? Because I really don't know. This chapter really deserves some review. Mm -hmm. The term competition is often used as the antithesis of monopoly. 
yet even a monopolist must compete with all other producers for the dollars of the consumer. The true restrictions on competition come from the government, not the market. So I think Mises mm. says that they're still valid prices because they still need to compete for the consumer's dollars. Uh, so there can be monopolies, but monopoly prices, no. Mm -hmm. but, or, or at least they, it just doesn't make sense to have monopoly prices. I mean, in the context, I think it's traditionally thought about. I mean, you can have a higher price because you have monopoly, but yeah. you're still competing for the consumer's dollar. Okay, that I, I understand that distinction then. So, part six, freedom. Our freedom and liberty to be found in nature. Hmm. I would say no, and there, the way it's phrased in the book is that um, a man is, if some, if a man is stronger than another man, the weaker one is subject, even in nature, to, you know, the other man not wanting to kill them. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, and that's a limit on our freedom? Yes. Yeah. He, yeah. And the way freedom and liberty come about is through cooperation in the market. That makes a lot of sense to me. I'm, I must have completely fallen asleep during all this thing <laughs> in this chapter, because... This seems like the one I would care about the most, and I know the least about it reading these questions. Um, but you read this, so you seem to know the answers. So it says, uh, comment. <clears throat> a man is as free as far as he can live and get on without being at the mercy of the arbitrary decisions of other people. Right. So, you know, in, like, primal times in nature, if you're a weak man, then you're sur sur like you're victim to the arbitrary decision of the stronger man not wanting to harm you or do anything. Right. It's do what I say or I could totally just kill you right now. Yeah. Okay. So how are the terms liberty and freedom related to the state and the market economy? So I, th I think I said they're, they're fruits of the market economy because it's a, it would be in the best interest for that stronger man to cooperate rather than to kill the weaker man. Ah, uh, so even though he could kill and enslave other men, it's still in the best interest of the stronger man to cooperate if rather the, than kill. If there's a market. Yeah, given a market, because then um, he can, his wealth and, um, what's it called, the, can, his condition can um, increase. Yeah, his satisfaction. Yeah. Um, Possibly without even doing much work, the, the, the weaker man might be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and improve his, his state. There was some point that Mises made in this chapter about how um, the market has, has produced comforts beyond that which King Louis XIV or, or some of the richest people in the history of the world could ever have even imagined. Mm -hmm. And so if, if bullies just left everyone alone, they could just do great, so much better than just bullying others into giving them what they have, because those weaker people could imagine ways to increase the condition for everybody. Right. But I guess, given the state, given a state, 
uh, it's in a bully's best interest to control and um, subject others because that's how they can they can get the most power is, is with the state I don't know. I'm taking a guess because I don't really know this chapter yeah. as well as you do. What do you think? Um, I'm not really sure how the, they're related to the state. It says how are they related to the state? Maybe it's in here. How are the terms liberty and freedom related to the state and the market economy? So, I mean, if you... There is no... If there's a socialist state, there is no liberty and freedom. Because there's no market. Mm, mm. And if the market... Freedom and liberty... So, if freedom and liberty don't um, originate in nature, they originate in the market. So, if you have a big, like, the bigger state you have, the, the less market economy you have, the more restriction on the market, market economy you have, therefore, the more restriction you have on liberty and freedom. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Great. Why were the socialist doctrines, which reversed the original meaning of the terms liberty and freedom, able to triumph, according to Mises? So I just read this in the summary. And it's because, you know, if, you have a so if you're a socialist state and you control the means of productions and the media, then you can... It's not really free speech if like you can control the media and the narrative and so you can like give the illusion of like freedom liberty and freedom I think that's what it was saying in the last paragraph of the summary do you mind if I just read it? yeah chapter 6 freedom second paragraph of the study guide at first, the socialists sneered at the bourgeois love of freedom, but it soon became clear that the masses would never support an open restriction of their liberties. Thus, the socialists contrasted political and economic freedoms. But if the socialist government controls the press and can assign its critics to work in Siberia, constitutional guarantees of free speech are pointless. Hmm. So right. you can't really separate political and economic yeah, freedoms. Yeah, now, now I remember this too. Yeah, exactly. Like they, uh, like the socialists will say, yeah, maybe you don't have as much economic freedom, but that doesn't hamper your political freedom at all. Yeah, because you've got freedom of the press. You just have to work in Siberia. <laughs> Well, that's funny. Funny and sad. What um, is the confusion behind the slogan, Planning for Freedom? This seems like uh, kind of a pop culture reference from the 50s or something. Oh. When this, at the time this book was written. Yeah. I don't know. That's, it may be. That's kind of what I got it. It's like, uh, like a... 
campaign slogan or something of the socialists. Uh, planning for freedom. Right. It seems like that's a socialist rallying cry. It's like, the more planning we have, the more freedom we can have. If we mm -hmm. plan really well, we can plan for this perfect, perfectly free society. Mm -hmm. But it seems um, confused, as Mises might say, because f freedom, well, I guess it like, requires the freedom of individuals to plan their own lives rather mm -hmm. than a, a board of directors, you know, for, for the country or something to, to plan for everyone. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I think that's, that's a good, good answer. Okay. <laughs> inequality, seven, inequality of wealth and income. Is it necessary to guarantee equality of income in order to obtain freedom? And the answer is no. Uh, it's almost to have a, a guarantee of inequality of income in order to obtain freedom because everyone has different skill sets and mm. does different things so their income is always going to be unequal and if somehow you guaranteed um, everyone's outcome was equal then there's no freedom because you can't because what if I, I didn't want to work if I if I don't want to work then I'm not gonna get any income that's my freedom to do that. Yeah. Is it necessary to guarantee equality of income in order to obtain freedom? Yeah, I think you're right. It's totally the opposite. And it's way more fun, the animating contest of, like, even during a poker game through several different hands, it's like, ooh, I won this one, or oh, no, <laughs> you won that one. It's like, you, there have to be these this constant winning and losing Right, how would you play poker in, like, a socialist? Yeah, uh, you it's couldn't. Like we all have the same hand every time, and everyone, <laughs> no, nothing changes. Like, great. Boring. What is compulsion, ju or when is compulsion justified according to Mises? I don't know. Sounds uh, like you'd never really be for that. <laughs> I, I wouldn't, and Macy's might not be, but I think in this context I was a little surprised to hear what I might um, characterize as a justification for compulsion in order to um, incentivize cooperation. Uh, for example, if, if someone is doing something uh, drastically harmful to society, it seemed like Macy's was saying that police would uh, intervene with compulsion, that the, the state, the apparatus of, of compulsion would, uh, I don't know, have justification for inter intervening. But the context of the chapter is in inequality of wealth and income, mm -hmm. so I don't see how that really is relevant here. Yeah, um, this is right around where I just kind of stopped reading. Yeah. So. And there are how many? Fourteen of these chapters. So you got through seven. Well, let's. What do you say? We just finish up the last fourteen next week. Yeah. And yeah. I may have to review some of what um, what we went over this yeah, week. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's getting about halfway through. Yeah, I think these are. Probably the most important chapters we're going through right now. Yeah. What's next? It's uh, so this is prices. Uh, it's so heavy. Uh huh. So the market. Uh, this is still the chapter that I would recommend to anyone who's like, I just want to read one chapter of Human Action. Okay. <laughs>